Welcome back. In the last section, we talk about the importance of white noise and random walks. In this section, let's discuss forecasting workflow, different methods and tools that are available for us. Each workflow had its own stages. First, we need to start with request, which will be our business understanding. Then we have to move on to technical setups when we choose our tools and it also influence our design. Our next stage will be modeling. And modeling is more like iteration from exploratory data analysis to model specification, estimates, evaluation of our model. And it could be several iteration until we satisfy with our results and we can produce forecast. And of course, based on our business needs, our forecast will be deployed. Let's look closely at the first stage of our forecasting. The first stage is request. So we need to develop our business understanding about what's being asked. Several questions can help us guide our understanding. First, the goal of the forecast, how the forecast will be used, perhaps we'll be developing a dashboard or will it be just a report? Who will be using them? The stakeholders, who will maintain them? At what level the forecast needs to be produced by store, by product, etc. At what time frame? Is it weekly, monthly, quarterly? And how long in advance do we need to generate forecast as we can do it for next seven days or next seven years? And what other external data will have to be used? Do we need to add weather, holidays, etc.? So the second stage is technical setup. Would be helpful for us to understand and plan ahead of time our workflow design. Are we using notebook? Are we using R, Python, or Excel, or other programming tools and software? Some experts also recommend to have one script or one notebook for each step. One for data processing, one for analysis, one for modeling, for example. Also, you need to decide how data is going to be collected, store, and where your script are going to be. Next step is data processing. There's a couple of questions that refer to data, data collection, data cleaning, and also feature engineering that we discuss in our last sections. Simply, you have to be aware of how data is collected, what type of queries, whether it's coming from database or web scraping, in what form, what level of aggregation do we need, what type of uh, time frames we're using. For data cleaning, you have to apply perhaps exploratory data analysis to see if you're dealing with outliers or there's a missing data and how to impute if needed. And for feature engineering, the most important question would be what additional features would help you discover patterns, right? It could be something coming from expert knowledge or it could be your a priori knowledge about data. And finally, when we get to analysis, important question to consider, do we have a trend? Is our time series stationary? Do we have seasonality? How external variables interact with each other and what are appropriate measures for our time series prediction model evaluation. All right, let's dive into the modeling and forecasting tools and methods. So in this specific course, we're using library, our library, Fable, which provide a large collection of commonly used univariate or multivariate time series for forecasting. Keep in mind, there's a lot of different libraries that you can find in our Python that will fit your specific goals. And typically model function is represented as follows. We have our response variable y, and we have our terms 
syntax for model specification. So y variable is written on the left and followed by tilde and we have our x terms. So this is the case of model function TSLM. We have our y, our response variable, and here's our axis. In this case, it's a function of trends model. This is just a function that we will use to estimate model specification on our specific data set. And in turn, we will produce a model table. So this is example that you saw in your recent homework where you apply in classical decomposition specification or model specification. It's always good practice to actually reference or assign reference name to your model specification. And here's your model function that will incorporate your model specification. And next we have coef, very useful function to extract coefficient from our models. And we can also combine this function with filter or select. Like in this case, we create a filter where we're looking at specific country and we're extracting coefficient. Here's our example. So we create model and we assign it to um, variable fit. We apply filter on our variable fit and we extract coefficient. The glance function provide us with one row summary of each model and it include description of model fit. So we have residuals, we have um, residual variance and other information criteria, uh, AIC, BIC, and here's example of output, table output. The results are only comparable when we are um, dealing with the same class, the same model class, right? And also if models share the same response. It's important, for instance, when we start applying some transformation on response or differencing. So next useful function is report function. It gives us nicely formatted model specific display. It's something that you probably used to seeing if you're, let's say if you perform regression analysis in R in the past and the table look very similar. The accuracy function provide us with commonly used accuracy measures. So this is very useful as you can compare different metrics. In our chapter 5, 5.8, you can read and refresh your um, knowledge about most commonly used measures such as mean absolute error, root mean square error. So we also have um, mean absolute percentage error, scale errors, all right, and the very useful function, the forecast, as you can guess, we use it to forecast when our model is selected. We can specify a number of observation that we would like to forecast. So it can be just a number. So how many steps for the future next uh, observation? For instance, h equal 10 is the next 10 observation. We can also use strings as h equal two years. So the next two years observation. And let's look at example Let's look at um, country Sweden with a forecast of three years. The augment function provides us with original data plus fitted values and residual values. So it's something that we can obtain separately by using just fitted function or residuals function. However, augment combine both of them. So it's very useful when we like to check if our model capturing the information in our data. So this is example applying augment to our model. After we filter for country Sweden, we have a uh, fitted values and fitted values are predicted values that are based on the previous observations. We have residual values. This is just a difference between observations and fitted values. And we have innovation residuals. So innovation residuals, it, those are residuals that been applied after some transformation. So the residuals that apply on the transform scale. And so all those three values are available with the original data by using augment function. All right, and finally we have a HeLa function. If you need to extract 
confidence interval separately. So this is example using Australian production ETS model. So, so here's our function model. We provide reference name to auto to our model specification, which is ETS. We have our response value that has actually transformation, log transformation applied to it. And we have our terms. In this case, we have error plus trend plus season. We are forecasting this model for the next three years. And we are, we want to extract levels 80% and 95% additional categories. And we can just select 80% and 95% and we can um, print it we can print it as a list. There are several forecasting methods that are very simple and very effective. And this method should be considered more as a benchmarks when you compare with other improved models. So let's start with the average or mean method. Our forecast or future predictions equal to average or mean of historical data available. Y1 to YT is our historical data. So we have um, Y hat is our predicted value y bar is our sample mean. The function that allows us to forecast using mean methods is simply mean, and we can combine it with a forecast. We can also specify a forecasting period. So in the book example, we're just using with a specific section from our data, using the filter index, allowing us to extract, because we have quarter, quarterly data, uh, we want to extract quarter one from 1970 up to quarter four from 2004, and we select the corresponding column. And you can see the result, resulting forecast for mean method, right? It's simply mean for our historical data. So there's a better method, let's say naive method, when we set all the forecast to the latest observation not the average of all observation, but to the latest observation value. So this method actually can be applied to many time series. Think of stock price data. And it does really provide us with a useful benchmark for applying other and comparing with other forecasting methods. So this is our last observation, and this is our predicted value. So the method is naive. Okay, this is our result. A naive forecast is optimal when we work with random walk that we talked about in the previous section. And it's one of the reasons why this method also called random walk forecast. And as a matter of fact, you can replace naive with random walk function and you'll obtain similar results. We can apply seasonal naive method. This is very similar to naive method, but it's only applied to highly seasonal data. In this case, we would set each forecast that be equal to the last observed value, but from the same season. So if we're dealing with forecasting, let's say we have monthly data. If you're dealing with forecasting for January month, they will be equal to last observed value from January. All right. So we're using, and to do that, we're using lag, lag function where we specify what type of lag we're using. In this case, we have quarterly data, so we need to specify one year lag in order to obtain quarter from the last year. In this case, we're predicting two year period, and here's our forecast. Drift method, naive method, where we actually allow some sort of increasing or decreasing in our time series over time. Do you remember the change over time? The amount of change over time is called drift. And drift in our case is said to be the average change in historical data. So from chapter five, we can treat it as equivalent to drawing line between the first and the last observation. And then we extrapolate into the future. So here's our first observation and here's our last observation. So it will be the average and then extrapolation to the future. We can also look at residual diagnostic, which is extremely important for us to understand how good our model is. So the first two points are important. The second two points are optional. So innovation residuals 
Do you remember the residuals after some transformation applied to the model? So innovation residuals should be uncorrelated because if they are correlated, it means there is some information in residuals that should be actually used for modeling. The innovation residuals should have mean of zero. So if mean is greater than zero, then forecasts are biased. If innovation residuals have constant variance, this is what's known homoscedasticity, and innovation residuals could be normally distributed. And finally, there is a useful function to remember, uh, time series residuals from ggplot that combine a time plot, autocorrelation, and also histogram. So it gives you a very good overview of your residuals at once.